You're watching Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz and our guest is Renata Cooper. She is the president of the Pasadena Unified School Board and we're so glad to have you back on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I want to speak with you about Pasadena. When we think about Pasadena, we think about a very well-heeled suburb of Los Angeles. We think about beautiful hills in the Rose Bowl. But when we look at the school district, mm -hmm. the school district is a bit different than our vision of beautiful Old Town Pasadena or the Rose Bowl. Well, and Pasadena is that beautiful city that it's people still envision when you think of Pasadena. But the, uh, the demographics of, of the Pasadena Unified School District, which encompasses the city of Pasadena, Altadena, and Sierra Madre, don't match the demographics of our overall community. Uh, one of the reasons for that is Pasadena has the largest number of private schools of any city of its size in the country. Wow. And so there, uh, on a pretty consistent basis, uh, about a, a good one third of the school aged children who live in Pasadena go to uh, private schools. Which are very expensive, of course. They are expensive. And Most so of them are very expensive. As a result, like you said, the demography may not match what no. the population is. No, vis -vis. our school district is 86% free and reduced lunch, and by no means does that match the demographics of the city of Pasadena. That is stunning mm -hmm. in so many ways, but that begs the question, which I want to ask you, the fundamental question, which focuses on what we know as the local control funding mm -hmm. formula, LCFF. If you would have asked me, would Pasadena be one of the school districts that would benefit from what we know as the concentration grant, mm -hmm. that bump of 50% funding if you have a 55% uh, population within the categories of disadvantaged economically, foster youth, and ESL, I would have said, no way, Pasadena, forget it. But and yet we do. I was wrong in a big way. We, we, we do, uh, we, because of, uh, Again, 86% free and reduced lunch. We also have a very large number for a district of our size. Right. We have a we have a pretty high concentration of foster youth really? in our school district Pasadena. because well, see, it's because it's Pasadena, Altadena, and Sierra Madre, right. and because of the way uh, uh, group care homes and the large social service organizations that serve foster youth tended to be built in unincorporated areas. So we have several of those that feed children right. into our district. Uh, and so, yeah, it all, it, it, and it, it, it does demographically, right. it, it paints a very different picture. And so we are actually one of those groups. So I want to ask you more philosophically about the LCFF, which, as I mentioned, there's something known as the concentration grant. If a school district has 55% above in those three categories, there's the targeted grant, 20% bump per child. Mm -hmm. So for a school district like Pasadena, and I've asked other school board members this, that's a 70% bump over the base grant. That's a pretty good bump. You know, philosophically a, speaking, what, what, what's your feeling of that? It's a, well, for our district, it's uh, about looking at about $5.2 million. So in terms of our, it's, it's significant. And if we, if we hadn't gotten it, we would have been looking at more than that in cuts. So it would have been disastrous that, had we not gotten it. But, you know, at the same time, I have to be clear that we're trying, we're still trying to get back to our 2007, 2008 right. levels of funding. But are so. we not getting back there? Because as I understood it, the compromise with LCFF was to have the base grant hit that pre-recession level, and then we can get bombs for LCFF. No, we are not back there, and we are hoping that we get back there, but at the same time we are cautioned, particularly by our state senator, that we need to look at this money as one-time money and not to, not to go nuts with it, not to, not, not to make the, we hope that it will be oh, a permanent fix. But LCFF uh, could get repealed, arguably. Is I don't that know her concern? Repealed. Her, her. Well, it's 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 based on a moving number. Right. And this is Senator Carol Lou, yeah, of course, who chairs Senate Education. Yes, it's mm -hmm. based on on what's coming in from taxes, and so right. we don't well, know true. from yes. year to year. So she's just cautioning us to be careful about how you use it, and at the same time, she wants us to use it in ways that actually benefit the groups that it's that it's um, designed right. to, to aid. And she wants to see, as do all the senators, I believe, want to see a clear uh, clear line in terms of improved child outcomes with that, with, with that group, which is important. And it's not necessarily how it, all the groups within a school district, which is a lot of staff funding, because that's what goes for most of, of your budget. Uh, every 
everything that you spend money on doesn't draw a direct line to child outcomes. So we really do need to focus on child outcomes. One of the things I'm very bullish on in terms of setting aside some of this LCFF money for summer school, because mm -hmm. we know that uh, child, there's, there's a loss they call the summer slide. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, got two daughters, and, I yeah, know what you're so talking we, about. We really want to make sure that we are able to increase the number of students that are eligible, for, able to take do summer right. school in our district. We have been able to have summer school because of our school age child care program, Pasadena Learns, and uh, our wonderful education foundation, Pasadena Education Foundation. But we need more. We need more, particularly we need more for targeting middle school kids so that which they're is, able to go into high school. Which is often considered the years where kids get lost. That kind yeah. of sixth through eighth where it just seems as if either you got them or you lose them. You know, I think they begin to tune out at that age. Mm -hmm. If they, kids know how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's some really developmental defense mechanisms that kick in by middle school. If you see yourself not as an achiever in school, not as one of the kids who does well, you, you, you start to tune out. That is it's so an ego defense. It's an ego defense. So I mean, what do you, can we do? on that issue. I'm fascinated by what you're saying. What can we do? What is done for that child who, look, may be gifted in some areas, but you know, book smarts may not be that child's We strength. have to figure out some ways of engaging them and we have to figure out some ways to make what they're good at, to make what they enjoy a part of the educational experience. And it's, we were, we were I was touring a school this morning, we were having a conversation about that, about how we begin to plan for summer school. So even a student who needs remediation in summer school, for example, they're not going to want to go to summer school if it's just remediation. So you have to put the remediation inside of some fun stuff because right. then, then that can be the lure to get them there. So it's it's complicated because it doesn't happen overnight. And again, one as I said earlier, there are some actual ver fairly healthy defense mechanisms that kids click into if they don't see themselves as doing well in school, if they don't see themselves as, as a scholar, for example. Right. I'm not that, I'm this. Right. And because we don't, be, as adults, we don't do it. We don't continually spend all of our time at something that we're not good at, it's something right. that we don't receive positive feedback for. You know, we're not gonna keep doing that. We're gonna find something else to do. Right. And so in some ways you don't fault them. It's, it, well, I don't blame them because it's, 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 it's normal developmentally. Right. That's the way human beings are made. We, we, right. we switch off if we're not getting so positive reinforcement. Do you think Common Core will help? Because Common Core, as we know, more project-based, not as bubbleized in terms of standardized testing and general testing. Do you think that kid who may not be that traditional scholar could shine well, the, in project-based learning? I think there's the potential. Uh, as we move into Common Core, it's something that creates quite a bit of anxiety in me because it's like th the switch is happening fairly quickly. Uh, we have to reconfigure how we're going to implement curriculum, how we're going to right. implement instruction. This year will be the first year that we've had funds to really do it. And this whole, th people right, talk- Right, a billion dollars, I think, or yeah. 1.25 billion was set aside for Common Core. Yeah. But statewide, I mean, right. and, I know. And, yes. and we should have gotten this three years ago. You know, right. we should have gotten the money to begin to plan for the implementation at the time it was adopted. And that's not the way it happened because of the way education is right. funded in this state. And, um, and the recession. And the recession. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's some very tricky things. I mean, I was reading a New York Times article on it a couple of weeks ago, and there are actually parents who are pulling their kids, not sending their kids to school on the days that they were being tested. It's a different wow. content issue. Mm -hmm. And when does it begin to count? Because everything, all these tests count so much. And it, let's not even get into the technology. Right. We don't have the technology to test kids with the Common Core right now. And we need to have it way before they get tested because the testing for Common Core should not be about how adept are you with the technology. The technology is supposed to be like this table. It's just right. supposed to be there. And it's not supposed to be about, do you know what to do with it? Her so. name is Renata Cooper. <laughs> she is the president of the Pasadena Unified School District. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Jay Chen. He is the president of the Hacienda La Puente Unified School District. I'm Brad Palmer. We'll be right back. How many public school students are educated in California? California public schools educate about 6.2 million students. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. Yes, we are now joined by Jay Chen. He is the president of the Hacienda La Puente School District, and I want to speak with you about Common Core. I was just speaking with Renata Cooper from Pasadena about Common Core. How is La Hacienda La Puente starting to move towards the adoption of those standards, which are quite different from what California has today? Well, we have uh, spent this summer really trying to get our, our teachers, our administrators right. prepared uh, for Common Core. And it's something that's been in the pipeline for a very, very long time. And I'm personally very excited about Common Core. Why? Well, the idea that now if you are uh, a student in California uh, and you happen to move somewhere else or you're coming from another state, the standards are aligned. We actually know what uh, our, our kids are learning. Um, across the board, we don't have a piecemeal approach to standards. And intuitively that feels good, but mm -hmm. look, you know, a kid in Hacienda is a right. little different from a kid in Hattiesburg. True. And so, do we want to nationalize in such a way? Well, the good thing about Common Core right now is just focused on English language arts as well as mathematics. And well, but there's some science and history thrown in there, no? Well, it, right now that's where the focus is, right. but um, the overall experience for the student, a lot of it's uh, the extracurriculars, right. it's the electives, those are the things I that understand. can really personalize an educational right. experience. So with Common Core we head more toward project-based learning. Yes. Which in some ways is very exciting, mm -hmm. but as I've asked others before, colleges aren't so much project-based learning. I mean, mm -hmm. you went to a large university, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we got tested. Yes. You know, we got, we had to do essays. Mm -hmm. So are we ahead of the game? I mean, do the university, universities need to catch up? Well, um, one thing that Common Core does do is it focuses more on writing, which you just mentioned. Okay, which is good. That is very good because I felt like I was a little bit underprepared for the amount of really? writing I had to do once I got to college. Okay. And now there's more of a focus, less on fiction, more on, on nonfiction, okay. on factual texts. And again, once you're in college, a lot of what you're doing is more uh, nonfiction based as well. I want to speak about what's known as the local control funding formula, mm -hmm. LCFF and it changes the way that we edu we fund education. Um, as I mentioned earlier in our program, there's a 20% bump for each mm -hmm. kid that falls into a category of English language learner, uh, economically disadvantaged or foster. Right. And then if a school district has 55% or more in that category, there's a 55% 50% uh, bump. Mm -hmm. Where does Hacienda La Puente fall? Do, I, do you get the concentration grant? We, I think we do. You do? We do. Mm -hmm. um, over 50% of our students are on free reduced lunch meals, right. which is a very good indication of the socioeconomic right. status. And then I would also presume you have a decent number of uh, English language learners. You have yes. a high co uh, concentration of Asian Americans, yes. Latinos. Mm -hmm. And so, so what do you think about this change in education funding? It is quite different than what we've experienced in the past with all the categoricals, mm -hmm. you know, what do we have, like 40, 50 categoricals before? Now we right. have under 10. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Well, I think the state has been moving us towards, uh, towards this formula mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, for the last several years, we could sweep categoricals. We've I mean, been given that. that we, we could sweep. Flex flexibility. Okay. So you can take categorical, you know, monies that were uh, geared towards certain things, we had that ability to sweep and then to okay. spend on the things that we felt really mattered. So we've kind of been moving in that I direction. I see, okay. But yeah. what do you think though about the fact, on the one hand we're giving school boards more discretion, mm -hmm. which feels nice because you're at the local level, but you know, should there be some oversight on this? Because you know, what's good in Hacienda right. could also be good somewhere else and yet they may think differently. Yeah, well I think um, school boards are actually not, they don't have as much power to oh, put really? money wherever they want, as some people might think. Even under lo local control funding Even formula? Even under that formula, because I think a lot of districts are still trying to get back to previous levels of funding. I mean, we are moving up to where we need to be. It's not like we're getting extra money that we won't know what to do with. There are True, programs though, out there. I mean, there. with the concentration grant, you're gonna have mm -hmm. more money than you had in the past, no? We will have more money than we had in the past, but uh, unlike, well, Hacienda La Puente hasn't had to do a lot of furloughs or layoffs. Right. A lot of other districts have had to. And so for a lot of those districts, it'll be a matter of getting back to where they were before. Right. With the do new you funding. feel as if there are winners and losers with local control funding formula? Or do you feel as if, look, we're back to the base mm -hmm. grant pre-recession. We need to focus on our more challenged students. Mm -hmm. This is a good move. I, I've heard that argument, but the bottom line is no one's gonna be receiving less money than they did last year. 
or, or pre-recession. I or mean, pre we get we got back to 2007, 2008, as I understand it. I don't with think with the base grant. Maybe with the base grant, right. but in terms of overall funding, right. what we were getting back then, not yet. Right. But no one can make an argument that they're worse off That's with true. local control funding formula. That's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of English language learners, mm -hmm. I want to speak to you about programs that are being adopted in Hacienda La Puente mm -hmm. and many other school districts. Right. I'm fascinated by them. Uh -huh. They are known as dual language immersion programs. Right. Um, why don't you explain for our viewers who are not familiar with these programs what exactly they are, mm -hmm. and then we can talk more specifically about what's happening in your school district. Sure. So dual language immersion, it's really, it's not just language acquisition, it's also content-based. It means, let's say you're in kindergarten, you are learning all of the subject matter you'd learn in kindergarten, but in another language. And as I understand it, in most programs, the way that it's structured is you start with a 90% instruction level in the non-native language, mm -hmm. and then 10% in the native language, and then it starts to shift upward in terms of the native language, and by fifth grade, maybe you're 50% each, is that right? Well, actually, dual language would be you'd be fully immersed in that language for the first part of the day. Right. And then the afternoon, you would be right. learning in your but, um, your other language. But isn't it that in the early years, you're more in the foreign language, and in the later years, you're starting to, it evens out a bit? Or maybe your school district's different. Yeah, yeah so our district, we've only had it for a few years, so I we see. don't have that uh, middle years uh, right. to compare to yet. Okay. Yeah. So you've had a program in Mandarin. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the program. You're a Mandarin speaker, no? I am. Okay, Wait, so, I'm okay yeah. well, terrific. So how how's it been? I mean, are the kids in that program already Mandarin speakers? So what you do need is a sort of critical mass of native speakers who speak at home okay. that can kind of help uh, guide along the students right. who are going in cold turkey. Okay. So that's what we have at Wedgworth Elementary. A lot of those students, they have the chance to practice at home, but a lot of other students don't. Now, the students that don't speak at home, mm -hmm. but are in the program, are they of Chinese descent as a majority, or are they Anglos, for example? A lot of Anglos, a lot of Hispanics, uh, even Koreans. How phenomenal that mm -hmm. must be for them. Yeah. Um, but in addition to having a rich Asian American community, I don't mean financially, I mean diversity wise uh -huh. in, in Hacienda La Puente, there's a large um, Hispanic population. Yes. And so I understand that Hacienda La Puente is looking at Spanish dual language immersion. Yes. Or so, you're beyond looking, you're doing. We're, we're, we're moving forward. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Hacienda La Puente is actually 70% Hispanic. Oh, wow. It's a very large Latino. The La Puente population. portion is more is Latino. Much more. So La Puente is 95% Hispanic, and oh, then if wow. you look at Hacienda Heights, it's probably more 40, 50%. And what about Asian Americans? Asian Americans overall is 15%. But in Hacienda, on the Hacienda probably side? Probably 30. Okay, so. 30 to 40. And then Anglos? Anglo You're 15, 20? So, okay, so, yeah. so it's a, really, it's a melting pot in a yeah, lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. So talk to us about the Spanish program starting this fall. Tell us about it. So it's something that we've wanted to do ever since we started the Mandarin Immersion Program right. because Spanish is also very, very important of in course. California. Of course. So we're going to start a program on the La Puente side at Valinda. Okay. And also on the Hacienda Heights side at Los Altos Elementary. So are the students selected? Is it done? Are we ready to go? Yeah, so we have... Um, over 20 or 30 students at Valinda who've expressed interest, they want to start. And over at Los Altos Elementary, we have almost 20. So Is that a good number? I mean, is that, is that what you need? You want about 20, at least 20, because there's going to be attrition. And if you oversubscribe, mm -hmm. is it lottery-based? If we oversubscribe, gosh, we haven't... It, it would be, because for the Mandarin program, right. there is a waiting list right. to get on. Yeah. So are you finding that those that want to join the program, are they already speaking Spanish in the home, or these non-native or, or, or speakers, individuals, individuals that don't speak Spanish yet? I think most of them are still people who have the chance to speak at home, and they know, and they have parents who, right. who want them to, to brush up in a formal environment. I think it's remarkable, and I'm glad to see that your school district and others mm -hmm. are looking towards different educational models, including dual language immersion. His name is Jay Chen. He is the president of the Hacienda La Puente School Board. When we come back, we're going to be speaking with a professor from Cal State Long Beach. He has looked at achievement between religious parochial schools and public schools. You won't want to miss that. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back. What percentage of dual language immersion programs in California public schools teach in English and Spanish. Over 86% of California's dual language immersion programs educate students in English and Spanish. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by William Jaynes. He's a professor at Cal State Long Beach, also a senior fellow at the Witherspoon Institute at Princeton University. And thank you so much for joining us. Glad sir. to be here. You came out with a fascinating study in connection with education, educational institutions, and you were looking at religious faith-based schools versus public schools and public charter schools. Correct. So those are the three institutions you're looking at. What did you find? Don't give away too much. We'll step through it, but what did you find as the headline? Well, the headline is that um, charter school students did not do as well as one would expect. I went into the study thinking that, okay, first uh, the faith-based students would do best, followed by the um, charter school students and traditional public school students, and the big surprise is that the students from the charter schools did no better than those from traditional public schools, even when you control for socioeconomic status and a variety of other factors. And this was a national study? This was what is called a meta-analysis. Explain. Okay. What a meta-analysis is and why uh, they are so often cited is what you do is you choose a particular topic, and of course this is a student achievement in these different types of schools, and then you take all of the studies that have ever been done on this topic, and it's about a three-year process. That's why not wow. too many of these are done. It takes forever. And then you combine them statistically to see what does the overall body of research indicate. And that's why they're so popular because people in government, professors, teachers, parents, who has the time to read all the studies that have ever been done on a particular topic? So what a meta-analysis does combines them all and says this is what the overall body of research indicates. Here's what's surprising for me. If you were comparing private schools, independent schools versus charter and public, I would have expected the results. But with regard to religious schools, religious schools, for better or for worse, they educate people at all socioeconomic That's levels. That's true. That's correct. And we know that, sadly, those at the bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum will not necessarily do that well and could perform under those students at public schools or charter schools. But even with this meta-analysis, those students at faith-based schools are excelling vis-a-vis -vis their public school counterparts, charter or traditional. That is correct. In fact, uh, one of the... Um, most notable findings that emerged from the study is that the achievement gap is 25 percent less at the faith-based schools. Both the socioeconomic and the racial achievement gap is, is narrower by 25 percent at these faith-based schools. It, yes. it, it truly is stunning because 25 percent is a huge number and we know that at public schools, specifically in California, the achievement gap is massive. Yes, it is. When you look at race, yes. when you look at socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you though about parental involvement. Because it's undeniable, and you're the academic, but from what I know, study after study indicates more parental involvement equals better Correct. student achievement. Correct. And if a child's at a religious school, presumably there would be more parental involvement. You have to make an affirmative decision mm -hmm. to Correct. send your kid to a religious yes. school. Yes. So does your study control? for parental involvement? Yes, it does uh, control for parental involvement. In fact, I've also done meta-analyses okay. on parental involvement. And? And yes, parental involvement is a major factor and there are, really, uh, there are really two aspects to this because yes, there is a sense in which parents who send their children to faith-based schools are more likely to be involved almost by definition. But it is also true that faith-based schools pride themselves on demanding a higher level of parental involvement. And uh, the meta-analyses that I've done on uh, parental involvement show that it even has more of an effect for children of color and uh, of those of low socioeconomic status. And in addition to that, the most important component of parental involvement is parental expectations. And that's one of the advantages I think these faith-based schools have is they insist that children, no matter what their background, take the most demanding courses, aim for college. Right. There's an attitude of God doesn't make junk. <laughs> and I mean, clearly, even if right. you believe that as a public school teacher, you can't say it. Speaking of faith, in our nation, we have faith-based schools of many denominations. There are Catholic schools, which have a long tradition of excellence. There are also Protestant schools. There may be Jewish schools, Islamic schools, Buddhist schools. I mean, a yes. whole host of faith-based institutions. Did you find distinctions based upon the faith? Well, the, um, as you might expect, right. the overwhelming majority of the 
faith-based schools were, were Christian, either Catholic Christian or, or Catholic. Both. Both. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, just under 50% are Catholic alone. Oh, wow. But that percentage has been declining over the years. So the Protestants have right. been decreasing, uh, Lutheran, Baptist, you know, what have you, independent, right. uh, evangelical, all of these have been expanding. But you, you do see uh, an advantage for faith-based schools uh, among the Christians, Catholics, among right. the Protestants, Jewish, and, and so forth. I wouldn't be as uh, um, strong in saying that you find that effect for Islamic and Buddhist schools only because there weren't enough right. of them in the study. Now, if you combine them with the others that are out there, you know, they're included in the effect. But I do feel comfortable in saying that Catholic schools, Protestant schools, Jewish schools, you mm -hmm. see a positive effect in terms of academic What's achievement. also interesting, and I'm not sure if your study looked at this, but you know, when, when I was going to school, not many, let's say, non-Catholic kids would go to Catholic schools. That's really changing. It had. You were, yeah. I'm glad you're aware of right, that. That's yeah. very true. I mean, there are some outstanding Protestant schools, for example, Episcopalian schools, for example, in the Los Angeles area. I mean, I know they have Jewish populations that are quite high. I mean, approaching 50 percent, even though it's Episcopalian or whatever That's it correct. may be. Does your study look at that kind of cross-denominational effect, or is it it's really beyond the scope? Other research I've okay. done has looked at that. And, and what can you tell me? That's a very good question. It, what 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 it shows is that actually the people who are not believers benefit more from these faith-based schools than our believers. Explain. Well, explain. Uh, the I think the number one hypothesis would be let's just say let's go back to uh, Max uh, Max Weber for a minute uh -huh. um, and his uh, belief in a religious work ethic. Right. Okay. Right. And. Um, if you are raised in a Christian home or a Jewish home, a lot of times that work ethic, it's already there in the home. You've already been exposed okay. to it. So, okay, if you if you go to a faith-based school, yes, you're exposed to it more, but it's, it, it's based on what economists refer to as marginal utility, meaning when you're first introduced to something, there's a, a huge increase, but then as time goes on, the the added effect is is smaller. And that's, that's really what you would find in terms of the effects of people of faith being introduced to a faith-based school. They already do have those high expectations. They already do have that discipline. The people, like I was raised in an atheistic home, okay, mm -hmm. and when I became, and I am now a person of faith, mm -hmm. and there was, you know, quite a sudden change in my life when I first became right. a person of faith. So it's that type of an effect where if a person who is not of faith suddenly enters an environment in which, wow, I, I can really do this. There are high expectations, yeah. Maybe God can help me achieve. Maybe this is possible. Now, they have a they have more of a, an impact. At the same time, uh, one could argue that faith-based institutions can be a bit dogmatic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they insist on a certain orthodoxy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One therefore could argue that could be a little stifling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's not a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You got to kind of think the way we think mm -hmm. or you're out. Mm -hmm. What does your study say about that? Well, I think that's becoming less of an issue. I mm. think that was more of the case back in the 1960s and with so the Catholic forth. nuns <laughs> yeah, whipping yeah, the knuckles. Exactly. Right. Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, I mean the, the, the Christian faith, uh, and one can say this about the Jewish faith ah. too, that the Christian faith, the, the central, the central message of the Christian faith is love. God even says, God is love. That's right. how he identifies himself. He could have said God is rich and <laughs> equally accurate, okay. but he chooses to identify himself as love. So that is the emphasis. So uh, the dogmatic orientation, I'm sure there's some schools sure. that are like that. There always are. There are public schools that of are course. like that for that of matter. Course. But I think that is the emphasis. And in fact, um, I was humbled with having uh, the uh, opportunity to speak at the White House a couple of oh, times. Wow. And one of the first time I was, the second time, sorry, I was invited. It was a result of, uh, and by the way, it's been yeah. for, I've worked with both the Bush sure. and Obama administrations. Um, so I'm kind of nonpartisan, right. you know, willing to work uh. with both. But uh, anyway, uh, George Bush called for this conference in his State I of the Union this. address. Will you come back and we could talk more about it? Absolutely. Okay, his okay. name is William James, professor at Cal State Long Beach. I'm Brad Palmer. This is Charter California Edition.